Good afternoon. I'm Wei Yi Cheng from Team Attractor MetaGenes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers and for this exciting challenge and also for this great opportunity for me to be here and sharing some of our findings and thoughts with you. So basically in this challenge, we use one of our recently developed technique we call the attractor metagenes to profile some of the biological events in cancer. And actually some, some of these biological events we found are actually pan cancer, which means we found this kind of biological event presented by some genes, like in all kinds of cancer data sets. And it is like, and we found these genes are actually unsupervisedly, we just found their expression pattern first, then we go back to look at the survival information to find the associations between these gene signatures and the survival. So let me directly go to an example of to show you how to find an attractor metagene. So to find an attractor metagene, you need three things. The first is you need a rich, rich expression data set. For example, we can use the TCG ovarian cancer data set, which contains more than 500 samples. Secondly, you need a seed gene. As an example here, we use the stromolinsen 3 The gene symbol is MMP11. Third, you need an association measure. Uh, you can choose whatever you like, like you can use Spearman correlation, Pearson correlation, but since we are, we are from the electrical engineering background, we prefer using the mutual information. So to find an attractor metagene, the first thing you need to do is to rank all the genes in your data set in terms of, in terms of their association measure with your, with your seed gene. So here in the TCGA ovarian cancer data set, we rank all the genes in terms of their mutual information with MMP11. Now we renormalize the mutual information so the highest it can be is one, which is MMP11 with itself. Now given this ranked gene list, you can actually create a metagene using the weighted average of all these genes with the weight function being a function of your association measure. So you can actually use, say, use the mutual information as weight, or you can raise the mutual information to some power to get higher resolution, or actually you can, say, create a sigmoid function based on the rank of the mutual information. Now, after you create a metagene using the weighted average, you can actually then re-rank all the genes in terms of their mutual information with this metagene. So here, we show you that you can see we, we rank all the genes in terms of their mutual information with the metagene. And because you see that in the previous metagene, because the MMP11 has the highest weight, so now he still has the highest mutual information, but it's not one anymore. And you will actually find the other genes starting to gain higher mutual information in the same time. So now you have this updated gene rank list, so you can then recreate another update, updated metagene and then we rank all the genes in terms of their mutual information with this new metagene. So this iterative process just goes on again and again. And in the end, you will, here I will show you that the change of the gene rank in terms of iteration. Here you will see that in iteration three, you got the almost the same thing as iteration two, but you don't see MMP11 anymore. And in iteration 10, you got the similar 20 genes as in iteration three. And in iteration 20, your gene rank list just don't change at all. So eventually, you will converge to uh, exactly the same gene rank list order. And in fact, there are like hundreds of genes will eventually converge to the exactly the same gene rank list. As I show you here, if we chose another gene as a seed, for example, we use GRAM1, which is like biologically relevant to the MMP11, and you redo this iterative process again and again, you see in iteration two, you already get the similar top genes. In iteration three, you don't see the seed gene anymore. And in iteration 10, you see the top 15 genes are the same. The only difference here is, here is 811, here is 810. Now in iteration 20, not only you get the exactly same gene rank list, but you also get the exactly same mutual information. Now why is that? It is because you have converged to the exactly same metagene. So, in fact, if you are given uh, like more than 30,000 genes and you run this iterative process using all the genes as a seed, do an exhaustive search, 
in the end, you will end up with only around 100, 100 these kind of attractors. And we can do this for all kinds of a data set, like for each different data set, we try to find 100 different attractors in each one of them. And an incredible thing is that you will find some of the attractor present a the almost similar form in all kinds of data set, independently of what kind of cancer type it is. So here we present two kind of example. Now I would like to emphasize that, remember the gene rec list created by this iterative process not only gives you a convergence, but it also gives you a, like a importance of the genes in this attractor metagene, because it is actually represent the weight of the gene in this attractor. So, here you will see if we only even just look at the top seven genes, there are already very similar genes appears here, here, and some genes. And here we actually just count how many genes appears as like in all four types of data set. And remember these are four different cancer types, including breast, colon, ovarian, and lung. And so this extremely similarity actually uh, indicators there are some like universal biological mechanism which can be represented by this gene. And because these genes are universally important, so in the end in our model we just take like the, the average of these genes to, to represent the whole biological process by them. So actually we found at least there are three kind of these pan cancer metagenes that we found like can be universally found everywhere one of which is the mitotic thing attractor metagene and the mesenchymal transition metagene and also the lymphocyte specific metagene. So because you can find them like almost anywhere and in such a universally format. So actually one of our colleagues from the medical center actually came up with the term that we should call them the bioinformatic hallmarks of cancer. So it, it is, of course, like a stealing from Dr. Hanahan and Dr. Weinberg from their ideas of hallmark of cancer. But we think it's the same idea that you can use in this bioinformatics methodology to find this kind of pattern everywhere in almost every data set. So as an advertisement, we are also like looking for <coughs> collaborators, try to like doing some complementary works, maybe confirm it in somewhere else or try to identify the underlying biology. So in the, in, the in the following, I would like to introduce to you like two of the most important attractor metagene, which we also use extensively in our model, and what their underlying biolo biological mechanism is, as well as like what's their association with breast cancer data set. So first I would like to introduce is the mitotic chromosomal instability attractor. So you can actually find this attractor, say, in all kinds of data set, and each one will give you the, the weight rank list of each gene, which represents the importance of the gene in this attractor. So in the end, you can actually create, create a consensus weight rank of each gene in this attractor using different data set. So we can see that the most important gene in this biological process is SEMPE, followed by DLGAP5, MILK, BOB1, et cetera. Now, to introduce this metagene, I have to start with this picture. This picture actually shows you a cell that's undergoing a mitosis phase. You can see the central mirror are separated, and they, the microtubule reach out to attach to the kinetal core, and eventually they just pull off, and you will have two separated cells. Now, if you look at the genes that make up, makes up the, the interface between the microtubule and the <coughs> kinetal core, you'll find an extremely enrichment of the genes that I have shown you in the previous table. So actually all the blue arrow that point to a gene that belongs to the top 100 gene of the mitotic attractor. So, well, I, I would like to emphasize this point because a similar signatures may have, uh, have already been found previously in different format using different method, but this iterative process is the first that we, we know of that can actually pinpoint to a specific small site of the cell that may actually be, we can see that they can also be a very good proxy of this whole process. So if you, if you there, there are gene signatures like SYN70, chromosomal instability gene uh, 70, which contains 70 genes, which is also where the, the, the term SYN came from. And also there are like the genomic grain index, but this signature is 
because this iterative process, we can like very confidently use, say, the top 10 gene of the attractor and put them in the model and to, repre to represent the whole process. And we are very glad that uh, eventually it's very prognostic. So the chromosomal instability has been shown and reported to be highly associated with breast cancer survival. So basically, in the, in the challenge data, you can rank all the genes in terms of their concordance index with the breast cancer survival. And basically, you can recreate the whole signature using them. Like, you can see SEMPE here, and BUB1, and cyclin A2, et cetera. And, but I would like to also reemphasize that our method did not use this survival information. We created it totally unsupervisedly, and we got even better results using like the rep representative genes in our attractor. Now, the second attractor metagene I would like to introduce to you is the mesenchymal transition attractor, which has the most important gene that's collagen 5A2, Versicam, THBS2, et cetera. Now, this signature we have been working on actually for some time, and we recently rediscovered it using this totally unsupervised method. And this, the genes in this attractor are usually like highly ex are expressed when a cancer cell is trying to invade the surrounding, sur surrounding environment undergoing a transdifferentiation called the epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Now, it is because of that, so basically the expression of the signature are highly associated with tumor stage. For example, in the ovarian cancer, you can only see that genes are overexpressed after, after stage three. And in colon cancer, it's a little bit earlier. It's, you, you can only see that genes are highly expressed after stage, stage two. But in breast cancer, it is actually much more earlier. It's actually the, the differentiation, differentiation, uh, differentiate expression are highly prominent between two phases called the invasive ductal carcinoma and ductal carcinoma in situ, which are actually before the stage one. It actually decides whether these breast cancer are invasive or not. And this association with early stage survival can also be validated in the challenge data set when we look at all the samples in the training set and try to plot the Kaplan-Meier survival curve. You will basically see no association here. Yes. But if, you, but if you restrict the samples to only early stage samples, you will basically see a very clear separation of the survival curve. And the higher expression of the signature basically means bad prognosis. So we, we also use this like extensively in the model. And I will just quickly go through some other attractors that we use, uh, especially this one. We think it's, it's also a bioinformatic hallmarks of cancer. And we call it a lymphocyte-specific attractor, and it is highly associated with the survival in the ER-negative samples. And it shows that when you have the high expression of the signature, you basically have better prognosis. And basically, we, don't, we, we, we only have speculations about the underlying biology, and we don't know, really don't, don't know anything about it, but we reported it, and we also posted it on the forum, and we hope that people can try to look into it and try to find the uh, possible application of it. Now, we, another, another application of this algorithm is that if you apply it in a genomically localized region, say like a cytoband, and you find an attractor there, you basically can hit on an amplicon or on a silicon. And so we also use some of that in the challenge. And also, we also use some breast cancer-specific attractor, like, the, of course, the ER attractor and also an HER2 amplicon. Now, the prognostic power of this attractor has already been like, found and used extensively in some biomarker product. And like for each, for like in Uncle Type DX or in Pen50, you can basically attribute each gene set into one attractor. But we think that because of our iterative process can actually pinpoint to some universally important genes. So we argue that if we try to replace some of them into our top genes in our attractor, it might have better application, but we are not sure, and it's something that we should work on. Now, given this informative attractor metagenes, the rest we need to do is just try to build informative model and try to extract as much information as possible from them. So we basically, in each of our submitted models, we use several subclassifiers, and we try to 
separated the information each one of them use by like either separating the features or using different criteria for feature selection. And in the end, we just simply added up all the predictors together to give an ensemble prediction. So uh, I, I don't want to elaborate too much on this, and I'm glad to answer any question on this if you have. So since this is still an ongoing process, if you are interested in the attractor metagenes idea, we welcome you to read our paper. It's still in preprint format. And we also uploaded uh, our source code as an R package on Synapse. We welcome everybody to download it and try it at home, install it yourself, try it on your favorite data set. And we also actually started a TCGA pain cancer project on the Synapse as well that we tried to uh, include as many data sets as possible, try to define a more and more precise metagenes and try to find the application behind that. And finally, I would like to thank my teammate, uh, Tai Shen, who has contributed a lot of work in this challenge as well. And of course, my advisor, Professor Anastasio, he allowed us to in devote a lot of time and work into this. And my pet, Goldie. And she helped me, she helps me debug sometimes so she's not too busy with her hair, you know. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, that was, uh, that was a very nice talk. Um, please, if you guys have questions, step up to the microphone. Uh, sorry, can you, can you <laughs> turn on the microphone? <laughs> can you give intuition why it converges, the iteration out? algorithm? Why it converges? Uh, we cannot like mathematically prove it, but y as you can see that the, the, when your genes has higher mutual information, it gets higher weights. And eventually, well, as, we, as I said, we cannot like really mathematically prove it. And it's like, like k-means, like in the end we just set a, a like I said, a cutoff for the iteration. If it, do, it don't convert, if, if it doesn't converge, then we just give it up. And but most of the cases, as we found, uh, they actually converge very well and converge to the exactly same thing for a lot of genes. Even if instead of mutual information, if you use like correlation. Yeah, that that will work as well. Yes, yes. The the result will of course be a little bit different, but um, in the end, you will find a very similar things. I think it's a great talk, and uh, it's really powerful that you two really like all the um, different cell lines, cancer cell lines. It really converges, and the results seem to be very biologically relevant. But uh, I just wanted like to get a cleaner result. Did you try to run the algorithm on like a control cell line on tissue, just to see in like a, like yeah. normal fiber blocks what the gene regs would be? and compare the difference in ranks. That yeah, that, that, that's something we've always wanted to try, like <coughs> compare the attractors in totally cancer tissue and compare it with the totally normal tissue. But the, the, the problem is that we, we haven't found uh, like a very good quality normal sample, say, contains like more than 100 normal ovarian samples, something like that, for a very fair comparison. I, I don't know if you have any source, and we'd be glad to hear from it. All we have is like, it's like a normal sample from all kinds of tissue, but you know, like different tissue will of course give you different expression of the gene. Yeah. But yeah. It seems like different cancer lines uh, correlate with each other pretty well in terms of mm -hmm. attractors. So maybe just like cancer versus non-cancer would be pretty informative. Uh, in some yeah, probably. No. But the thing is, we also for for this att attractor to work, it, it actually <laughs> needs like more than 100 yeah. samples. And so that, that's also a limitation, I agree. And so yeah, yeah, we would be glad to analyze more data. And if anybody has that kind of sources, please contact us. Uh, our emails are here. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Okay. So related to the positive control issue, have you tried of, uh, applying your method only on HER2 positive samples? Yes. And if yes, do you find the uh, the HER2 amplicon or anything related to the HER2 pathway there. Uh, sorry, you mean HER2? So if you apply your method only on HER2 positive oh. samples. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's always an interesting question. Like when, when I present it somewhere else, somebody actually asked me if I do the algorithm between the ER negative and ER positive. It's always something that we can try. And of course, it's like, I guess the, the essential question is what kind of question you would like to ask. Like what kind of variation you would like to find among the HER2, HER2 say positive samples uh, just as a positive control, because in, in HER2 samples, you should find uh, the HER2 amplicon or something related to the pathway, because they're addicted to that yeah. oncogene. Yeah, we, we, we didn't like try, try that uh, yet, but it, it's always interesting to, to see that if you restrict the sample to some subset and what will you find. And yeah, I agree that's something that we, sh we can work on uh, in the future. Um. The two uh, metagene class virus that you put at the top yeah. and the fact that they had a um, logical uh, biologic uh, function is uh, in encouraging. Mm -hmm. but the one that I liked the most was the uh, second. It wasn't about the chromosome uh, um, oh. positioning. Mm -hmm. It yeah. was this uh, EMT the, um, uh, transition. Yes. Um, and the reason, uh, and this is what I like about science, is having just come back from the ROTC ACR meetings in uh, Dublin. The hot news there is a s couple of papers that are coming out that haven't been published yet that show by doing RNAi knockouts in trying to shift cells in terms of their sensitivity that genes that modify this EMT, this uh, ability to go between this mesenchymal versus uh, not transition, um, actually are major determinants <laughs> of uh, sensitivity to uh, therapy. And um, what is really fun is when someone is finding something in an entirely different, entirely different system, and you're finding it over there, then it's even more encouraging than finding that there is something that sort of, quote, feels mm -hmm. right uh, uh, in terms of the biology. And I'll try to connect you with those uh, people. But it's, it's, it's encouraging in general, but in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's thank him again.